Mr. Eads was first elected to the Denton County Commissioner's Court in 2007 as County Commissioner in Precinct 4. Then in 2018, he was elected County Judge for Denton County. In that role, he presides over the Denton County Commissioner's Court, the county's governing body. With a population of just shy of one million, Denton County is the sixth fastest growing county in the nation. At the helm of that county's government is one of our own MPA graduates, Andy Eads. Please join me in giving a warm UNT welcome to my friend and former classmate, Judge Eads. Thank you. I told Jennifer she held up better than I did. <laughs> Let me get that right there. Well, good. Well, it's where's our clicker? You know, what, Jennifer, we grab my clicker there. It is. Uh, well, it's great to be here. I uh, uh, isn't it great to be back together again in person? Oh my goodness. I uh, I got to tell y'all a quick funny story here. I knew Jennifer when she was single. We were classmates, and when she was Jennifer Howery. And I had the, the great honor of introducing her to her future husband, Mark Fadden, who was an intern at Addison right behind me. So I get the credit or the blame. So I don't, I, it's probably credit. It's probably credit. But it's great to, it's great to, uh, to be back in, in person with you all. And I will tell you, Dr. Bland, where's Dr. Bland at? Where is he? There he is. He's always about to take a I'll smile for the camera. He, uh, I'm doing my fair share of keeping MPA students and graduates employed up at the Ditton County. Uh, we have uh, several people. Rena Maloney is one of our, she's in our office. Uh, Michael Talley, our former economic development director, we were proud to hire him. Our budget director, Alejandro Marino, is an alum. And we got Jennifer Rainey here. Jennifer works in our health department. Let's give Jennifer a big hand. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Jennifer was, Jennifer was uh, pregnant with her child when we were doing all our COVID vaccinations out there. And she had, she, we threw her a baby shower out at Texas Motor Speedway in the command post. And it was all decorated. So I think that was a very unique and unusual uh, way, place to have a baby shower in the middle of a pandemic. But when you're working seven days a week, that's kind of where we take the, we took the shower to her. So what's well, great to be here. And what I thought we would do today is I've not given this speech before. Um, and I've saved it for this group because we've talked about this this day back in the fall. And I really wanted to give you all a sneak peek uh, into our COVID response efforts, stuff that we didn't really publicize, and really focus on lessons learned through the pandemic that regardless of which discipline you're involved in, uh, in the public sector and even the private sector, these are some great lessons learned uh, along the last two years. Um, this picture is of my dear friend and mentor, Ron Whitehead, who I think is the Dean of Texas City Managers. Let's just give Ron a big hand. I went to work for Ron. Uh, I, God blessed me with the relationship I had with Ron. We still maintain it all these years later. I met Ron in 1995 when I was still a student up here and went to intern with him at the, at the Addison Town Hall. That's a picture of Town Hall there. And uh, I worked for him for six years in the city manager's office and development services, the finance department, and HR. When I left the town of Addison, I was... I, I left Ron, I was meeting with him, and, and, and I said, uh, I hate it, you've invested so much time and energy and effort in cultivating my career. And he says, trust me, everything we've invested in you, you will put to good use. And he was exactly, he was exactly right. So I love Addison. Uh, while I was there, I wrote a history book about the town of Addison, and I named my second son Addison after the man the town of Addison is named after, Addison Robertson. And so I always tell my son, you better be glad I didn't work for Waxahachie. So, you know, as we, as we think about COVID, the different county judges across the state really handled it differently. We, we handled it differently. And some of that was political ide ideology. Some of it was personality and how they wanted to handle things. And uh, I would tell you today is really as a, as a firsthand inside account of the details uh, that we've never discussed before. And Jennifer alluded to this briefly about the role of the county judge in the state of Texas. And Denton County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state and in the nation. And actually, uh, the Denton County judge has more constituents than four governors. So Denton County is bigger than four states. So just think about that's how that's that's the magnitude of the services we provide. And so constitutionally and and through our local government code, the county judge really does serve as the CEO 
and the, um, as a county administrator. And we have this kind of buried down in the fine print, uh, our broad emergency powers, which the Texas public gained a lot of knowledge of uh, as we went through the pandemic. This next slide here briefly uh, kind of illustrates some of the county services that we provide at Denton County. We provide cradle to grave, everything from your, you know, your birth certificate to your marriage license to your divorce decree to uh, your, your death certificate and even probating your estates. We really are a cradle to grave uh, operation that we've been going strong since 1846. This next chart kind of outlines a rough organizational chart and there are over 40 elected officials that work for Denton County. Over 40 elected officials. It's very different than your, your council members who volunteer or may have a small stipend. These are full-time county employees with or benefited county employees with retirement system. And so these are your full-time professional public office holders. And the state of Texas believed in divesting the powers of county officials among many office holders. And so the powers are very different. The structure is completely different uh, than your city government that you are many times accustomed to. And you know, in the county government, because you're dealing with all these elected officials, it's very much a pull relationship instead of a push. Instead of pushing down rules and ideology and so forth, it really is kind of bringing along your other 40 elected officials. I can't tell the sheriff what to do, or the county treasurer, or the constables, or the other judges. And so we have, it's very much a, a, um, a relationship built on trust and, and personal relationships. But it does help that the commissioner's court has the power of the purse. And so that does kind of help us with our relationships with our other elected officials. You know, I just want to tell all of you what a great privilege it is to get to work for the public sector. And you know, Dan's nodding his head, Ron's nodding his head, and so many of you are in the business or aspiring to be in the business. And I will just tell you, it is a great honor. And I just want to thank you for answering the call to public service. Thank you for answering the call to public service. Yes, go, yes, applaud. Dan's applauded. Yes, thank you. You know, how blessed, how blessed we are that we get to impact policies and decisions that make lasting impacts on communities, lasting impacts. The fingerprints that, uh, that we have are lasting, create lasting impact and generational change. And you know, whether you're building a fire station or a park or helping youth through troubled times, uh, through our court system, we really are in a unique position to help with generational change. You know, and I, I tell people, there's very much a ministry opportunity as you work in the public sector. It's very much a ministry opportunity, and it's not necessarily articulated, but it really is. And I, I hope that in your organizations you really cultivate a ministry mindset, because I know at the county, we see people at their very worst as they're going through some of the most difficult times in their life. They're going through a lawsuit, they're going through a divorce, they're a victim of crime, uh, they're in our jail, they are, they are they're going through some very difficult times, and so if we can have, some, have those ministry opportunities and speak into their life in a transformational way, I believe that, that is, that's what we are truly called to do. You know, I, uh, there we go, right there. I love this picture because this was the very beginning. This was our first meeting we had with representatives of the 40 different elected officials across the county. I convened this meeting early on uh, during COVID in our different various department heads, and there was uh, lots of unknowns. We knew some things, and we didn't like what we knew, but there were so many unknowns that we were on the edge of discovering. And so we had this large stakeholder meeting, and we were trying to think about it. We were trying to modify the operations of a county that has been running in very much the same way as when it was created in 1846. 18, they, were, they were getting marriage licenses back then, and, and, and the different legal structures and some of the same functions were practiced and fulfilled now uh, as the same way they were done in 1846. And so we had to totally do a continuity of government operation mindset, but do it anew in different ways. And we had this meeting, the elections administrator, Frank Phillips, was sitting to my right, and I'll always remember this. He got a phone call, and he stepped out of the meeting, and he said, um, and he came back in, he had a kind of a startled look on his face. And I said, well, tell the group, what, what's the call about? And he said, I just got a call from a colleague in Louisiana and they just canceled the Louisiana presidential primary. And that was just a chilling effect over this whole group, this big, large committee. We thought, okay, this is real. I mean, they're canceling elections. As we all know, they later canceled the municipal elections and delayed those to the fall. But uh, we're, we're, it's great that we have a history department 
at the county. We have, a, we have a, a office of history and culture. And so during those very first weeks, I went down, I gathered everybody together and I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to prepare a briefing document for me about how did the county operate and how was it impacted during the Spanish flu of 1918. And they pulled together the facts and figures. And I'll tell you, the more things change, the more things stay the same. If you'll see that second bullet point there, uh, back in 1918, right here in Denton County, the schools were closed, the churches were closed, the movie theaters were closed, uh, and there was a ban on public gatherings. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar to y'all? And so one of the things that was different was they had Boy Scouts uh, on their bicycles travel all over the county, all over the county roads out into the country and hand out flyers giving the latest updates on how the, how the Spanish flu was impacting the county and the different precautions to take back then. And we use social media now, but we, the Boy Scouts were great back during that time. I love this picture because it, it kind of symbolizes so much of what we had to go through. And you know, there was changes and we were thinking uh, new lifestyles as we went through this. It totally changed our whole entire life and also the role of government, the role of government and the role of government in our life. And some people appreciated government more than ever, and some people did not appreciate government more than ever. And so, but it was, it was new to government what we were going through. This was something new to us. You know, we had not seen anything like this in our lifetime. And so what I really stressed to everybody, I did it publicly and I did it privately and in our different communications, but for everyone to apply grace to one another. Everyone to apply grace to the situation, regardless of your ideology, regardless of your viewpoint, uh, to apply grace to the situation as we all go through this together. There were definitely some immediate first steps that we went through, and I, I, I uh, signed 10 disaster declarations in the first six weeks of the pandemic, and those were later ratified each week by the commissioner's court. Uh, we obviously had our weekly press conferences and our daily briefings, and those went on. Uh, social media monitoring and updates literally 24 7 and so one of the things that was so interesting was the huge volume of interaction with the public and so we were having to deal with huge volumes of calls we had to set up call centers in my office and for the health department in different different county facilities we had to set up huge call centers and I would tell you that was so important because the human interaction that people had with their government instead of just seeing a Facebook post or something so people could actually get their questions answered in a thoughtful, caring, loving way in walking people through the complexities of what we were dealing with. One of the things that we did uh, that we helped enforce of the governors was the governor closed the enterprise of golf. The enterprise of golf, so the golf courses were closed, the beer carts were closed, the golf shops were closed, and it was interesting because when we did that, it was at the same time as the beauty shops and nail salons were closed. And so I got zero calls from women about hair and nails, zero. And we got a thousand emails from the men golfers. A, a thousand, a thousand. And it was crazy. And so, you know, the governor called me on my cell phone one day, it was right when all that was going on, and I said, he asked me a question about the state school, and I said, do you have a couple more minutes to talk about golf? And I said, okay, we're holding up to your, your orders exactly as you articulated. Am I right or wrong? Is, did you close golf or did you not? Because the other counties are not closing golf, but we're trying to abide by your order. And he goes, no, we closed golf. I said, okay, I thought we closed golf. And uh, I said, well, could you clarify that a little bit more for my colleagues in the neighboring counties? And so it was, it was, it was interesting that all these men were calling and wearing us out, and the women did not uh, call and complain about hair and nails at all. They, they really took one for the team, and it, it validates my longstanding belief that any woman who aspires to be equal to a man has low ambition. So I, uh, I'm serious about that. That's an applause line for all the ladies, okay. So this next slide really kind of articulates our four, what I would call four avenues of service. The four avenues of service, obviously we had a medical response issues, which we, which f first and foremost, we were dealing with eviction prevention. We were dealing with business grants to help shore up our businesses that had been closed by the government. And then our nonprofit grants, our nonprofit issues. And so uh, these, were, these were completely, the, not the healthcare, but the, but the scale of it was new, but these were completely new programs that we were setting up from scratch, stuff we'd never done before. And we were just learning it as we go. And so I've got a few life lessons here that I would, I would like for us to walk through. And this first one is create a core team. And this picture was taken early on, and you could tell 
because we're all together in a close proximity. Um, but I think um, it, it exemplifies the, the importance of a small core team. And there was five core people that were part of the leadership team uh, as we executed COVID and, and all of our response efforts. And I will tell you, it is vitally important uh, that you staff up in advance of a pandemic. And I'm so glad that when I became judge, I, I realized that we needed to staff up in a few areas in my office and our communications office and some other areas. We had just reorganized the health department a couple years before. And so we had some of the infrastructure in place and thank goodness that we did because we would have been really uh, bad off if we did not have our core team together. But it is important that you have bandwidth to absorb the unexpected. Right, and I think so many times policymakers um, are make a, a mistake in having such a minimum level of staff uh, just to cover the basics that you never have capacity and bandwidth to absorb the unexpected. And so that was a real big uh, lesson learned. And so when you also when you think about uh, what we were executing, we were executing it remotely. We weren't having staff meetings in the summer of 20. Everyone was working remotely and keeping our distance because we had to keep the team together, we had to keep the team healthy, couldn't have anyone go down. And so we were, we were working new and different programs in new and different ways and working separately but always uh, together at well. And so our core team was the Office of the County Judge, our Director of Emergency Service, our Director of Public Health, and our Director of Community Relations. And the five of us worked together day in, day out with constant communication with the Commissioner's Court to execute. And the Commissioner's Court could not have been better. We were unified in everything that we did. We were unified in unity and purpose and spirit and also in the details. And so uh, that core team had to work uh, really seven days a week with daily calls. And I would com compare it in contrast to some of my other colleagues, my other judges across the state. And I said, well, how are you handling this? And they'd say, well, I have a 40 member blue ribbon committee of industry leaders advising us and everything. What do you have? And I said, well, there's five of us <laughs> that are pulling this off. And I would tell you, I think that was a secret to our success. We had broad public input, but it was a small core group making the decisions in an, in, in an execution mode. And so I, I think that was, that was very, very, uh, very beneficial to us. I would make a suggestion that on any core team that you have, you have to have your public information officer, you have to have your communicator in the room, understanding the decisions, why they're made, providing input to say, you know what, that may not be a good idea because of what I'm seeing on social media or what I'm hearing out in the public. And so it is vitally important that you have your communications team there. And this is a great picture of Don Cobb, our director of community relations. She was a managing editor of the DRC up here for a couple of decades and she helped grow along with the good help of Jennifer Rainey and others, helped grow uh, our Facebook presence to be the largest Facebook presence in all of Denton County. So, uh, so that we're very, very, very pleased about that. But it wasn't just about Facebook. It was very important that we, hand, we met people where they were at because we were communicating truly with our audience was eight years old to 80. Eight years old to 80. And so it was a different kind of environment. We decided that we needed to meet people where exactly where they were. And we had to use new communication techniques and also the traditional ways. Uh, and at the same time, think about public involvement in, in the public sector. It's usually in person public meetings, right? Where you gather everybody together. Well, we couldn't do that. We couldn't receive public input in your traditional way. So we had to receive input in new and different ways and remote ways. And so, our second lesson that I would mention would be that to create partnerships, to create partnerships and in advance of the issue that you're having to deal with. The old saying goes, dig your well before you're thirsty, right? And I would tell you, um, the years of good relationships that the commissioner's court had, that our department heads had with our cities and our state officials and our state delegation and our emergency response uh, efforts down in Austin and at FEMA, the Fed, those relationships we, were critical to our success, and we couldn't have done that. But I will tell you, there, you know, in the middle of a crisis, there's no time to do relationship development because you're very task-oriented, mission-oriented. And the trust was already established uh, through years of good relationships with them. And when you're dealing with your partners, I think it's important to communicate with them. We have a, that's a little screenshot there of one of our Zoom meetings that we had. We had Zoom meetings day in, day out, just like y'all did in your own businesses. Uh, but we had weekly Zoom meetings with all the mayors, city managers, superintendents, uh, and the uh, legislative delegation and their staff, and also the Chamber of Commerce presidents as we wrote out. Those were weekly meetings for two years that we had. And with these partnerships, I think it's vitally important 
there's a great picture there of DCTA because we, we said, DCTA, you're not running a bunch of trains and buses and everything. Uh, you can go to work and deliver uh, our PPE to all of our different nonprofits across the county. And so it's important to find your partner's capacity and utilize their skill set and their, and their, uh, their wheelhouse where they're good at, what they're good at, and utilize that. And so it's exactly what we did and use their expertise. And I love this picture down here on the right because uh, it kind of reminds me, you know, some of those Zoom calls uh, we did not want to do. But, but it was important that we consistently communicated with folks, that we consistently communicated uh, the needs, because not everybody was on the same call from last week, and so the continuity of communication was very, 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 very important. But some of those you didn't want to do, and it kind of reminds me of that old George Burns joke about sincerity. He says, you know, the, the secret to success is sincerity, and if you can fake that, you've got it made, you know? So we, we had to really work hard on some of those, keeping a, keeping a, uh, a smile on our face as we were slogging through a lot of communication, a lot of epidemiology. And our next uh, core business was uh, our rebuilding our local economy and the importance of rebuilding our local economy. And so the commissioner's court was very concerned about the businesses that were closed or partially closed, and we wanted to make it up to them in a financial way, and so we, had, we did exactly that. And so we developed an open for business business grant program that we executed, and, that and we did that in three different grant programs throughout the summer of 2020. And uh, we realized that it, it required swift and decisive action to execute that, because we had to get the money into these businesses rapidly so that they could stay open. And so time was of the essence and you know went round and round with the staff because they were wanting us to contract with this nonprofit that would uh, that would administer the whole grant program and it cost millions of dollars. We've got to procure them and go through the whole thing. And I said no we can do this in-house with Denton County employees. It's very important to me to have Denton County employees, Denton County friendly local employees answering the phone and walking people through that. And that's exactly what we did. And so the Commissioner's Corps was a little apprehensive administering this program in-house that people would say, well, you gave business grants to your friends and neighbors and supporters and all that. And so I said, okay, how do we get around that? So I called the auditor on a Sunday afternoon and I said, would you, he reports to the district judges, the 11 district judges. So he, it's an armed links transaction. I said, would you, if we, if the Commissioner's Court created all the criteria and all the guidelines and so forth, all the procedures, would you administer the grant applications? And he said, it'd be my great honor. And I said, perfect. He goes, can you send me some people to help? I got, we're busy. And I said, absolutely. So I got on the phone and called all these different elected officials, the county clerk, the district clerk, the treasurer, uh, all these different office holders. I said, can you send me three or four people, three or four people, three or four people? And we did all of that in-house. And we're one of the very first counties to do that. And we were the model of counties across the state of Texas in how to execute that. And we're very, very pleased that we were able to do that. CoServe was a great help. Uh, I thought we we're going to do the online application. I thought, we don't have time to set up one. I thought, who, who has an online grant application? CoServe, the CoServe Foundation. I called CoServe and said, can we borrow your computer, uh, your module uh, for a few weeks or a couple of months as we roll out this whole thing? And they said, judge anything you need. We're here to help. That's what co serves to do. And they turned off, they said, we're not accepting grants right now anyway. And their staff went in and redid the whole website and was able to receive those grants in a timely manner. I tell that story because that happened over and over and over again across this county. We were never turned down. I remember calling Neil and I said, we were going through stuff at the beginning there. And I said, if we need to utilize the gymnasium to set up some medical clinics and so forth, can we use your gym? He said, anything you need anything you need. And so that was exactly what we heard uh, over and over and over again. But early on in 2020, we received our federal CARES dollars. This is a great story. It was a Friday afternoon. The county treasurer called me at the end of the business day, and she says, are you sitting down? I said, yeah. She said, I was driving home a little bit ago, and I got a wire alert email from the bank, the county's bank, and we received $147.7 million just got wired from the feds into our bank account. And I said, well, obviously they got our application. <laughs> and, and it was a little two-page application. It was basically basically your entity and contact information and your routing number. And, and we didn't know what we were asking for, how much it was going to be, but it was $147.7 million. And she was driving home and had to pull over on the side of the road and was divesting all the, all the different, uh, into all different bank accounts and investment instruments overnight because it was a Friday for the weekend. And so uh, that, was a, that was a pleasant surprise. And we used those funds 
uh, in a variety of ways in different buckets of money there that you can see that we work to uh, that we work to uh, have our different county operations and one of the things was that we we dispersed to all of our different cities across the county their local allocation of federal dollars that they were able to use for police and fire and for other response efforts and so that was their per capita allocation but not only were we dealing with with governments we were dealing with our nonprofits and so our, we have you know a couple of hundred nonprofits across Denton County do wonderful uh, meaningful life-saving work and they were all of our nonprofits were, were receiving two to three hundred percent increase in need and then think about it so we got an increase in need and then their fundraisers were canceled and then think about the volunteer base for so many of the nonprofits, they're senior citizens. And so the senior citizens were not getting out. We didn't have a vaccine yet. So you got an increase in demand, decrease in revenue, and your volunteer base just left you. And so that was, that was very uh, important to the commissioner's court that we supply grants to our nonprofits. That's exactly what we did because that truly was uh, a perfect storm for our nonprofits. Our fourth lesson would be make services available to all. And this is a big county, it's 900 square miles. And so we realized that we had to many times take the services to the people instead of the people coming to see us. And so we did, we modified our testing so there'd be a drive-through testing so it'd be easy for each and, each and every one of our individuals that didn't have a car. We could, we could work out different um, operational efforts to achieve that. But really, making services available to all was something that was very important. The accessibility and the equity issues were strong values of the commissioner's court. Uh, DCTA was a great provider for us. We were the very first county in America to have complete door-to-door -door service, free of charge, to a vaccine clinic. Yes, thank you. And I'll give you a little secret. Have meetings at four o'clock on a Friday and say we're not getting off the call until we have the solution identified. And so that's exactly what I did. I got DCTA and uh, Span and others on the phone. And I said, this is a deal. We're going to go big. We're going to go out to Texas Motor Speedway. We need door-to-door -door service for everybody. How are we going to do it? And everybody would call DCTA. They could book their ride, a bus or, or other modes of transportation, or they could park and ride at DCTA. We had buses running on the hour from all of our train stations to take you out to Texmore Speedway. If it didn't make sense, if you're on the west side of the county, or you didn't have transportation to get to a bus station, I'd called all of our rotary, our rotary clubs and had the Rotarians volunteers. We had a whole fleet of volunteer drivers, just like Uber, that would pick people up. They'd, one call center at DCTA, if they couldn't accommodate it, they would book a Rotarian to go pick them up, drive them out there to own lane for all the, for all the Rotarians to drive through as they go right through the line and take them back home. Free service, first one in the nation, door to door service, free of charge, and accessibility was not a problem with Denton County getting vaccinated. And we realized Texmore Speed was way over the end of the county. I said, how are we going to work around that? And that's exactly, that's exactly how we did. But if you think about it, we were working outside in the elements, outside in the elements. And so th these pictures kind of exemplify that. Our, 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 our healthcare workers, our volunteers uh, were out in the weather, and we became very good friends with the National Weather Service because they were, they were, um, they were key uh, to our success. We, we never watched the weather so close in my whole life as when we were having all these outdoor uh, events and clinics. This picture, my wife saw this last night. She said, my God, you look young. And I said, well, it's the first week of COVID. <laughs> of course I look young. But um, I will tell you, not only were we concerned about the financial health of the county, the physical health of the county, but the mental health of the county. And before this first press conference, I, I, went, I went downstairs, I wear them out. I went downstairs to the, our, our art department and I said, would y'all make me a sign with our uh, mental health crisis hotline? Because I, I want to physically hold this up to demonstrate. I made the front page of the paper and went all over social media and I wanted a visual so that people could see the number and that we talk about it because the mental health was critically important. It's something we're still dealing with. And that's not news to this group, but it's something we're, st we're still dealing with. And so we needed to talk about you know, the financial health, the physical health, but also the mental health of those. And think about it. People are not at work, they're not at school, they're at home, close quarters, right? Very close quarters for extended periods of time with record alcohol sales. 
And so, so we, were, we were like, okay, this is, this is a thing. This is a thing. And so we've got to work on the mental health, and that's exactly what, that's exactly what we did. And we communicated that throughout, throughout all of our, our communications and not to be mindful of that. And we stayed in close communication with our health care providers, our mental health care providers. And he was exactly right. And so the bigger the operation, the more details are involved. You know, and as a leader of an organization, you have to have one foot firmly planted in the big picture. And you really have to have one foot firmly planted in the details of the operation. You really do. You may have good people, you may have great people, uh, but the, the detail mindset is what is very, very important to a successful operation. And I'm, I'm glad that we surround ourselves with detailed individuals. You know, our very first vaccination clinics, again, we have a geography issue, since so our very first vaccination clinics were up here at C.H. Collins, the north part of the county, and we did those for a while. And then we went down to Louisville, to First Baptist Church, Louisville. We had clinics there, and we went back up to C.H. Collins. And so the state of Texas was giving us small allocations of vaccine as they were getting it. So it's 900 the first week, then 1,500, then 3,500, and then we got 5,000. And the state of Texas was watching us and seeing how well we performed. Am I right, Jennifer? They were watching us. And every day, we're having to upload thousands of medical records. That day. Not tomorrow. That day. We're uploading all these medical records that day. With all the fields had to be programmed accurately and so forth. And so we're having to upload all these records basically in real time. And because we were a good steward of the resources they gave us, and we were a good partner, they gave us more. And so we went, we got to 5,000 and then they, we got the, the alert and they said, oh, by the way, you're getting 15,000 next week. And everybody looked at me and I said, Texas Motor Speedway, let's go big. We're going to Texas Motor Speedway instead of breaking up and going all over. We did one big me mega clinic and uh, that was so successful. We were so, so proud of that. And we were doing the hard stuff. We were doing the Pfizer, which you have to agitate the vial 10 times. Very, you can't shake it. You have to agitate it. It's very complicated. And thank goodness for all the wonderful nurses and paramedics across this county that came out there and worked for us. Uh, but we had to scale this. And we scaled this from a, mobile, from a clinic up here at CH Collins to Texas Motor Speedway in a week. In a week. 16 lanes wide. And the, the, we, we had opened it up for about three hours and the White House called down and said, oh my gosh, we just got reports of this wonderful vaccine clinic and y'all beat us to it. We haven't set up the federal clinics yet. And would you send us your aerial footage, your operational plan, your whole manuals, everything. Will you send it to us today? Because we're modeling all the, all the federal sites. That's what we did right here in Denton County. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? We set the world record and, ma and maintained the world record for a long time on, on the largest daily count of vaccines right here in Denton County. Who got their shot from us? Who got their shot? Good, good, good. Wasn't it great? It, it, was, it was a great process. We vaccinated people from 45 states. 45 people came from 45 states to get their shot from us. We call it medical tourism. It was a worldwide, it was. I'm like, go to Bucky's, you know, and they're like, what's Bucky's? I said, trust me, you'll love Bucky's. Um, it was a worldwide news story. We, had, we actually had the, the French version of the BBC fly over from Paris and interview me out there on site because it was, it was just went around the world. And Rob Ramage of the Speedway was telling us he kept getting all the, all the press alerts from around the world. The Today Show came out there as an international story because people like successful stories. They really do. And it was, it was something where we all came together. Our sixth lesson is IT powers the way. I'm telling you, we could not have done it without our information technology department. They were the, the hidden heroes behind the scenes, uh, executing with our, our decisions and our big ideas on a daily basis. They were, number one, first focused on the continuity of government operations, but they were, we, they were also working in a virtual environment as well, and so they were executing all these ideas and creating totally new systems. And again, we're dealing with HIPAA and medical records every day by the thousands, and they're having to create new modules and reporting that. And I'll tell you, because of the IT department and the excellent job that the Denton County IT department did in conjunction with our health department and their record keeping and how they worked together, they saved lives here locally because we had the credibility that the state knew that they could give us more vaccine and they kept giving us more vaccine and more vaccine and more vaccine and more vaccine and we're okay, okay, and we, and we just kept rising to the occasion, adding more days to the week and vaccinating more people because we had a wonderful IT department. Think about it. 
IT people saving lives. I mean, it really, I mean, it really is a, um, it is a, it is truly, uh, they were some of our hidden heroes. And so when you see your IT people, when you get back to the office, go, go give them a hug. Um, if we can do that these days. Um, the seventh lesson is expect the unexpected. Again, we're running a county. We're running all the operations, road and bridge and a jail and all the different things. At the same time, we're dealing with a new disease and we're learning about it every day, just as everyone around the world was learning about it every day. And the rules were changed with the CDC and other entities. And so we, we had our call takers. Remember we talked about these call takers. And so not only were we communicating externally to the public about operational changes, but we're also having to communicate internally and brief them. They're like, okay, I just got it all down. I just figured out all the advice we have to give these people. And now you're telling me it's changing again. So we're having to do lots of communication internally and externally, uh, and all going during the midst of the, uh, this pandemic. And while we're doing COVID and all this COVID response, we're also building this lovely building, which is our, our new landmark for the county. This is our new administrative courthouse. And so while we're so focused on COVID, we're having to th think about construction and change orders and all of that that we're dealing with on a daily basis. And so that was, uh, and the delays associated with that. And so that was, again, that was a planned project, uh, but we were dealing with so many other uh, issues in addition to our normal scope of services. And as we all know, and we all sadly remember, while we were dealing with a new disease, we were also dealing with an old problem. And with the death of George Floyd, it became national, not only was it a national issue, it was also very much a Denton County issue that we were dealing with in the spring and summer of 2020. And so in the midst of all that we were doing, we were scrambling around and I was calling the Texas Historic Commission and getting an emergency addendum onto their, their agenda uh, to seek a permit to remove the Confederate Memorial off of our courthouse lawn. And some other counties did not get permits, they didn't do it the right way, but, but I said we're gonna do it the right way. And so thoughtfully and diligently and respectfully, uh, we, were, we were locating art movers and going through a procurement process on art movers to relocate uh, that memorial which had stood on the Denton County Courthouse lawn for a hundred years. And so uh, we did that and we relocated it uh, inside the courthouse. And so that's just one of the many issues that we're dealing with at the same time. And as careful as I was, <laughs> I got to see the inside of a COVID ward um, firsthand uh, in the fall of 2020. And I would tell you that really allowed me to have a full appreciation of the, the issues that our healthcare workers were going through as I got to see that up close and personal firsthand. You know, my wife is the president of the board of the Louisville Hospital. And so we were always talking about the issues the hospitals were dealing with. And I was dealing with our five hospital executives, our CEOs on a, if not daily, weekly basis all through COVID as we were talking about the issues as it impacts them. And then to get COVID myself uh, and to see that firsthand uh, was, uh, you know, really brought everything full circle and, and brought it home. And, you know, weeks before I got COVID, I thought, well, if I get COVID, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I thought I would err on the spirit of transparency. And so we had a press release all ready and prepared. And then I came down with COVID. And, um, and so we had it ready. And so when I, I tested positive uh, that day, you know, we had to drop that press release. I thought it was the right thing to do, right thing to do. And then I had to, as I was not feeling, I was feeling worse by the minute and not feeling good at all, uh, had to do six network interviews that evening from my home office. Uh, and, but I, I did that as a way to communicate to people, to get their testing, to get their, um, to get their, to get testing and that, you know, we'll recover and keep your, keep your chin up. But not everyone in my office was so fortunate and sadly, in the September of 21, um, I lost not only uh, uh, our chief, uh, Roland Acevedo, he passed away from COVID. He was instrumental in setting up all of our TMS efforts that very same year. Uh, chief Roland Acevedo was, not only was it an operational loss, it was a deep personal loss to me. I've known Roland for 15 years, part of our Denton County family. And I had the pleasure of swearing him in to his new job, his promotion as chief in 2020, and I had the great honor of delivering his eulogy uh, in the fall of 21. And I would tell you, um, the county was so loving and 
and tender and caring to his family. And we said, we will, his widow said, can y'all help us? Can y'all do the funeral? We said, absolutely. And so we, out of our office, our emergency manager, we, we did all the funeral planning for his funeral. It was a very official funeral with agencies from across the state of Texas coming to honor the life of Chief Roland Acevedo. Um, and I will tell you, it's an important story to tell. Okay, he had great contributions to the county, but it's also important to know that when you're going through a crisis, you may lose some of your team members to the crisis you're dealing with, or they may lose a loved one and they have to be out of the picture because they're dealing with their own family situation. And so that was a real uh, a lesson learned by us. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the wide variety of issues continued. Uh, again, we were dealing with, um, we were dealing with our food program. This was one of our better ideas. We had, we had our food pantries had, again, they had a huge increase, three to 500% demand in the 39, I didn't know we had 39 food pantries till I've lived here my whole life until um, COVID happened. And we had 39 food pantries across the county, large and small. And so we said, let's develop a sustaining program that's very sustainable. And we have so many local farmers still here in Denton County, it's amazing. And so local Denton County farmers, we contracted with them to fill food boxes, about 30 pounds of food each week. And we're still providing, and it's thousands and thousands and thousands of locally grown, locally sourced uh, food boxes across the county. And that's something that we're continuing to deal with. And this is a happy story about COVID. We were on a Zoom call with our 13 superintendents in the spring of 2020, and it was me and the health director and the superintendents. And they said, Judge, how will you allow us to do graduations this, this year? And never in my wildest dreams, when I sat over in the classrooms here getting my MPA, did I ever think I'd be planning a high school graduation, <laughs> ever. But I said, well, let's think this through. And they said, we'd like to do them in July. We'd like to do them in July. And, and uh, Matt Richardson, our health director, Dr. Richardson said, we're actually gonna have a spike in July in cases the way the epidemiology is going. I don't think that's really good. And I said, and I don't like that idea because I think the people who go off to the military academies or the boot camps uh, and many times college, they leave early and I don't think July would work. And you'll never get those classrooms, those graduation classes back together. And so I think it was a God thing, it really was. And I had this idea and I said, I thought about it for a second while they're all talking, and I said, okay, 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 I'm not making you do this, this is just a, an idea. What do y'all think if we did it drive-in movie theater style over at Texas Motor Speedway and all the parents could watch it on Big Hoss? And I kind of winced for a minute, I thought, oh gosh, what are they gonna kill me? And about 10 second delay, which was a big 10 second delay, in, in unity, they all said, we love it, we love it, this is a great idea, and I said, okay, okay, let me, let me see what we can do. And I hung up and I called Rob Ramage, who's over to Speedway, a dear friend of mine. And I said, Rob, it's Andy. He said, well, hello, Judge, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm gonna ask you a question and you cannot say no. <laughs> and he said, what's that? I said, what if we have the graduations over there at TMS? And he said what so many others had said before and after, Judge, anything you need, you got. Anything you need, you got. So think about it. The class of 2020, those kids left the Friday of spring break never to return to high school, that graduating class. No goodbye to the coach, no goodbye to the principal, no goodbye to the friend, no goodbye. They left. And it was critically important that we have a meaningful graduation for those kids. I'm so glad that we did that. And uh, it, it really brought, brought closure uh, to them. And, and, oh, I'll go back. Look at this. Up on the top right, anyone recognize her? Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian came and greeted all uh, uh, virtually. We had a great video, lots of different dignitaries, lots of different folks on there. And uh, Kim Kardashian did a greeting to all the graduation classes out of Texas Motor Speedway. And we were very pleased uh, that she could make an appearance with us. We really tried to make it memorable for the kiddos. And this was great. I said, I want to have the kids, there's a finish line right there, all the race cars pass the finish line. Let's have them cross the finish line of high school on the finish line. So, all the, so they set up over there on the track and all the kids, they'd call their name, they'd walk down the stripe, uh, the, the checkered flag painted there and go get their diploma while mom and dad are watching on and the family's watching on the big screen. And it was, it, was really, it was really great. And what was really neat was that when I hung up with Rob and we had the idea and he approved it, 
he called his colleagues at other tracks across America, and it went across America. People graduating at tracks, not just here in Denton County, but really across America, helping that class of 2020. This is a huge lesson. Creating a culture of volunteerism. Creating a culture of volunteerism. We have wonderful volunteers for years at the county, and we could not have done what we, we did without thousands and thousands and thousands of volunteers contributing large and small parts. And, and, and one of the, my key jobs uh, at TMS was you know, I get there in the morning, and it would take me a couple of hours each day, was to walk up and down every, Jennifer's nodding because she saw me do it day after day, walk around to all the different positions of all the workers, the, the FEMA workers, the different, all the workers, the Rotarians out there working, everyone, and personally thank them for being there. Personally thank them for being there. And I think that your job as a leader is to, to be visible and to be that person to send thank you and make it a personal way. And I'll tell you, it was such demand, and those were some of the horrible elements out there. We had some of our coldest weather ever during our vaccination clinics, I kept telling these people, I promise it's not always this cold. It's usually pretty nice around here. Uh, but creating a culture of volunteerism was so important. And when we would send out the daily alert for the sign-up sheet for the next week, it would fill up in about two minutes. Fill up about two minutes because people wanted to come back. They wanted to come back. They wanted to come back. And as I walked around at uh, Texmore Speed, what people would say, Judge, I haven't agreed with everything that happened at uh, through this whole pandemic. I don't agree with everything, but I can be part of the solution. I can be part of the solution, and that's exactly what they were. Our Medical Reserve Corps were wonderful. Uh, we have hundreds of volunteers from our Medical Reserve Corps. And you got to say thank you, not just physically or verbally say thank you, but really demonstrate an appreciation. And I'm so pleased that we had a big, huge barbecue dinner for our volunteers. We invite anyone who volunteers or worked at TMS, we invite them back for our very last night there in May and, and, and had a big barbecue dinner with t-shirts and swag bags and challenge coins and mugs. And I had a friend has a big jumbo Trump, Jumbotron company come out there and we did a big video of appreciation. And I make a living going to banquets and appreciation dinners. I'm in a banquet every Saturday night and lunches throughout the week. And I've never been to one so unique and so special because of the great spirit in the room, because people realized they were part of something bigger than themselves. And they were, knew they were saving lives and doing something hopefully once in a lifetime. And so showing that appreciation to them was very, very important. And this next lesson is find the humor. Find the humor in what you do. Our, our team, we would laugh together, we would cry together, we'd cuss and fuss worked hard, but I really, from the beginning, encouraged our team to, to laugh, and we would, we would make jokes and laugh. You just gotta laugh about some of the stuff, the emails you get, some of the Facebook comments and stuff, you just gotta laugh about it. But this is one of my favorites. I photographed, I took thousands of pictures through COVID, thousands of screenshots of the commentary to give to our museum one day, so that when, when a future county judge asked, how did they handle the pandemic? So there's a great record here, locally, a local record. But this is a sign I took off the Pizza Hut in Flower Mound, Texas. And it says, must wear a mask by county judge mandate. Now, the, we never did a mask mandate in the county. And people kept thinking we did. And they kept emailing me, mad. But we didn't do it. We thought about it, and we chose not to. And about a week later, the governor did a mask mandate. The governor did a mask mandate, <laughs> not us, the governor. And so I went to get the pizza. I went in to get the pizza, and I said, hey, and I was paying, it was a takeout, and I said, um, hey, while I appreciate the, I was real nice, I said, well, I appreciate the sentiments of your sign out there, we should all be wearing a mask now. Um, it's the governor who did the mask <laughs> mandate. It, it, it's really, it, it's the governor, it's not the county judge, it, it's the governor, and he goes, um, he goes, no, he didn't. And I said, yeah, he did. He goes, no, he didn't, and I said, yeah, he did. He goes, no, he didn't. And I thought, okay, we're getting nowhere. And I said, well, um, okay. I said, well, actually, I am the county judge. And he goes, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, I have an ID in my pocket, but I said, have a good evening. And I walked out. So he probably thinks he, he won, you know, but I thought, oh, this is COVID. What is this world coming to? 
So I, t I show that picture and tell that story that you got to keep a sense of humor. I came back and on our next call the next day, our, our team, you know, I, saw, I told him that story. And we still laugh about it because it's just one of, those, one of those funny things. In closing, I would just like to, uh, to say, um, and I put this picture in here, and it's something that I kind of settled on this concept of lighthouse people 15 years ago when I first became an elected official. And that is, I said, I need some lighthouse people. Lighthouse people. And if you think about a lighthouse, a lighthouse gives direction in the fog and in the dark of night, and it prevents you from running ashore. And we need lighthouse people in our life. And I would tell you, wherever you're at in your career, or y'all students that are about to graduate or go through the program, or y'all mid-career, end of career, or after career, to, to be a lighthouse person and find someone that's a trusted advisor that has your best interest at heart. And, and I will tell you that just because someone's in your circle doesn't necessarily mean that they're in your corner, right? Just because they're in your circle doesn't mean they're in your corner. These are lighthouse people who speak truth to you, that have wise counsel. And Ron Whitehead and I have a lot in common. One of the things we always say is that we collect people. And I think collecting people, a lot of people have different collections and stuff. I like to collect people, Ron collects people. And I think collecting people and collecting lighthouse people that will speak truth to you and help you. And I'll tell you, have a mentor in life and be a mentor in life. That is, it's a very rewarding experience. And finally, check on your strong friends. It's important to check on your strong friends. The people who would call me and text me and say, I'm going to send you a message. I know you're covered. I know you're slammed. I don't expect you to respond. But please, please know that I'm here. I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you. My family's praying for you. You know, Mr. Rogers has a great story of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And these parents asked him about violence and tough issues and crisis. And they said, you know, when my kids see these things on TV, what should we tell our children? What should we tell our children as we're going through disasters and different situations? And Mr. Rogers says, tell your children to look for the helpers. To look for the helpers. To look for the helpers when you focus on the helpers, not the disaster, but focus on the helpers, the people that are helping. And those people, y'all in this room, the public administrators, the public employees, they were the helpers. In addition to the volunteers, they were the helpers. What a great honor to get to be the helper, as Mr. Rogers says. And finally, there's this old saying that says, we should do good with the expectation of nothing in return. Do good with the expectation of nothing in return. It's called being good for nothing. <laughs> and if we're good for nothing, we can do great things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Eads. That was incredibly inspiring, and I cannot think of a better way to bring us all back together and focus on our mission of, of public administration and leading our communities in times of crisis and in good times. So thank you so much, Judge Eads. One more round of applause for him, please. It's not often I get teared up at this event, but... Andy, you know, what do you say? Okay, it's uh, we want to try to wrap things up here pretty quickly and send you on your on your.